Okay, haters, it's time for another episode of I Hate Real Estate. My good friend Kendall Grooms, how are you? Good. Hey, Jamie. Well, welcome back from Vegas. Thanks. Did you win or lose? I lost. <laughs> Did you really lose? I won by going. Oh, okay, but mm-hmm. you lost money. Yeah. Well, that's good. At least you didn't lose any clients while you were gone. No. I did. Not that I know of. (laughs) I lost one or two, but you know why? From telling the truth per usual, people want to throw properties on the market in this condition right now for way too much money. Have you been seeing that going on? Yes. Have you received any emails about unsundry behavior of real estate agents in this market? No. Not yet? Okay. Well, we're going to talk about market conditions and how they affect the behavior of real estate participants in the market. Are you guys ready for this? So ready. (laughs) It's going to be fun. Okay. So the first thing we're going to go back to, we had a story last week. We did a hot topic about appraisers and how um, there was a case picked up by the Supreme Court where they were investigating how an appraiser came to someone's home and basically looks like they discriminated against the occupants of the home based on their race. And so now it's you know, being looked at in that way. So it's I called the Supreme Court, but I thought it was a Supreme Department Court. of Justice stepped in. That's even worse. It seems like probably. Yeah, you're probably going to jail. So <laughs> here's the thing: I hate real estate for a lot of reasons. Some days, and t- and today's one of those days <laughs> because of a, multiple reasons. But I spoke to an appraisal buddy of mine, a couple of them, after we had that conversation. And I called him and said, like, "What's your thought on this?" And a lot of them seem to be a little bit frustrated about the fact that the appraisal industry kind of gets overgeneralized. And I guess my question to you before I even start talking about it is, do you get a lot of complaints about appraisers? Is it mostly agents? We, I get no complaints about appraisers. It's a very objective. We, I guess, I think I have recently had one complaint about an appraiser where someone was bouncing around suing an appraiser, but it was essentially that the appraiser failed to perform a home inspection is what the claim was. Wow. They wanted, they came back like three years afterwards and said that the air conditioner went out and the appraiser should have known it or something like that. Or, the or a furnace. Or I think it was oh, a okay. furnace something or something like that. Like They've been lines. bouncing the case around. Yeah, and you're like, well, uh, no. Well, I'm not a home inspector, so there's yeah. that. Well, I'm also for the purposes of this but show. But they had a home inspection also. I was going to say. And you want to blame it on the appraiser. Well. I mean, that's the easiest guy to blame. And so that's kind of what I was going to pull up to the situation. So before we get into the market conditions, let's talk about how you get value. We all know we've, we've listened to this show before. And if you haven't, my experience in real estate appraisal and in real estate sales, um, leads me to tell you that the way that appraisers value property is based off of either a sales comparison approach, an income approach, or a cost approach, which is basically the value of the property according to the opinion of the appraiser. So this is not a fact. It's not something that you can just this is how much the house is You can is have worth. 10 different appraisals and get you will get 10 different numbers. You, you should get 10 different numbers. Or you have 10 people who have been trained by the exact same methodology <laughs> who think the same way. And that would be bad for the industry. And so I say that to say, this is the first example of how much I hate real estate this week. There was a listing put on the market. We're not going to talk about the address. <laughs> but we put it on the market at a price. And I feel like I'm okay at pricing property. I've sold a few homes for you. This other agent reaches out and is like... <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but I live in that neighborhood and that house is not worth that amount of money. And I politely, you know, sent back the emoji thumbs up because that's, we all know what that means in real estate language. If you don't know, you're probably getting a lot of those messages. Thanks for the info, but we're going to ignore it is what it means. So, and it brings me to market conditions because Mm -hmm. the first question we, the next day we put this thing on the market at night, next day it goes under contract 5,000 over asking when I'm obviously 50,000 over asking to begin with. So immediately I'm like, haha, told you so. But I'm also, seller calls me and is like, well, what happens if it doesn't appraise? And I'm like, well, then it comes down to the choice of the buyer. They can make the difference up. They can choose to pay more for the property or they can say, I'm not going to pay more than this and you can come down on your price. Well, what's the risk in it? Well, the risk is that it doesn't appraise. But let me answer this question for you, Mr. Seller. What are the terms of the contract? Did you get into this contract with a willing seller and a motivated buyer in market conditions where property is appreciating? And there are there homes around there near this value? Yeah. I'm not worried about it because that is the indication of an opinion of value, right? Is all the market conditions combined together with the opinion of the appraiser based on the sales or whatever approach they're using. So I kind of want to start the show on the fact that the appraiser is an independent part of this process and they have to be included when you're using financing but they are not coming out here to undervalue your property or to overvalue it. They're doing it to form an opinion based on an approach. Thoughts? Yeah, they're not looking at 
something where they're trying to say, we're going to punish this person, or we like this person, we're going to reward them with a higher property value. Or they're not saying to you like, oh, well, this house has never sold in this neighborhood at this price before, so I can't do it. Yeah. And that's the thing I'm running into. Well, aren't in you, you're supposed to only consider comps within a certain amount of time, aren't you? Certain amount of time, certain distance. So all you're not going to go look at a comp that's eight years old and say, hey, this same property sold eight years ago for this price, we have to consider that. You might look at it if the same property sold just to get an idea. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if other houses around it are selling at much higher than what they would have sold for eight years ago as well, then your property should too. Well, in a perfect Assuming it hasn't fallen apart or had major issues or something like that. Right. And it's funny because the word assuming comes up and this is the thing. Appraisers aren't, yeah. they're kind of always making assumptions, okay? Because yeah, you have to make assumptions. How else are you supposed to? Now because you can't do a property inspection. Really? That's interesting. So FYI, the appraisal <laughs> inspection are totally different. And that's something that I feel like what you just mentioned too is a lot of times homeowners, home buyers, consumers, they don't understand that the appraiser has absolutely no knowledge of how to perform a home inspection. And they have to make the assumption that when they show up and they turn the heater on or they check the utilities, which is only required in those FHA appraisals anyways, um, that's all they do. They don't crawl in there and check the condenser on the air. Look, at, I don't even know. They don't get in yeah. there and fix those pieces. And so they probably don't flip every light switch in the house. And no, and sometimes plug things in. And when, what about houses that are vacant and in terrible shape and that are being appraised as is that don't have any utilities on? I mean, these properties still have to be valued according to the rules that are set by the Appraisal Institute and the Arkansas Licensing and Certification Board for Appraisers. And so I'm just going to start out by bailing my industry out, which for the purposes of the show, I have no licenses. But um, for the appraisal side, you know, that's one of those things that you're not a bad guy. We're not bad guys. And if you have questions about the appraisal, there's nothing illegal about asking or communicating your questions or thoughts to an appraiser and theirs back to yours. I had an appraisal recently done on our house because we did a refinance. And he actually sent me an email and said, and he asked me questions about when we put a deck on the house, when we did this to the house and that kind of thing. And he, he asked all those questions for the purpose of gaining knowledge of other value increases that might not be indicated by other houses in the market. Because yeah. if you have something that's different than the market, you also have to consider that. Yeah. And this is, this is a really good show to turn into because as far as, you know, market conditions, Arkansas hasn't seen a lot of what we've seen in these past few years. And I have a lot of experience in this area because when I started appraising and doing real estate in general, this was right at the height of, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so I watched a lot of that appreciation happen and I did it on the West coast and you guys have, I mean, you got hit by like 10%, maybe 15% at some of your worst areas. And there were people in Las Vegas and in California and New York, like losing everything. Not even people. You had entire subdivisions that went under. And subdivisions that never got built and all kinds of stuff yeah. that went on. And so it's one of those things where I think people miss the fact that this is a very key component of the whole entire process. And it's something that is so much more involved. Like that's why it takes so many years to get involved. But back to the market conditions pieces, especially if you're in Arkansas and you're not used to seeing this kind of appreciation, it is a little scary as an appraiser to throw a price tag on something that's never been on it before. And I think that's where people get scared about like overpricing. But at some point, the values are going to continue going up. Up. I mean, you can't be Little Rock position like you are in this market and not continue to appreciate. Yeah, and the appraiser doesn't have that option. The appraiser shouldn't have the option to look back at 2009 and say, well, I can't price this. It's they too high compared back at to what it has been. Yeah. They have to price it for what it is. And for what's happening right now. So you look and at it. And if the market turns and starts going down, they have to appreciate it the other direction or depreciate, depreciate it, it the other direction. And that's the other part is like people have been asking me, what's going to happen in the market? When's the bubble hmm. going to burst? Like y'all haven't hit the bubble yet. <laughs> so there's that. And then once when it when anything turns or changes, this all still comes back to the actions of participants in the market. And that's why it's so important for the market participants to be knowledgeable about each piece of this process. And if you're working with a real estate professional that doesn't have knowledge of every single piece of it, that's when you open yourself up to the risk of, okay, now I'm screwed and I don't know how to get out of it. I got to call Kindle and figure out who in the process took advantage of me and or what information I missed to not be an informed consumer. So that being said, so piece of advice on that one, agents don't give other agents advice unless you work at their firm. <laughs> so there's that. Um, so secondly, I want to talk about um, something else that happened. You, you actually brought it up, so I'm going to do it because we were going to talk about market conditions. And what I'm having problems with in this particular market is that people are coming in our state and spending their money on property and they're waiving their appraisal contingency and they're buying property sight unseen. And then they close on it 
And then they're calling the agent back and they're very upset because something is wrong with the house or it's not worth what they paid and or they overpaid when they figure out that everything around them is valued less. Have you dealt with any of that in this market so far? Not from a legal standpoint, but I've dealt with people that were trying to close such transactions. How'd that go? They've all closed that I know of and I haven't heard any complaints back from anybody. Well, what I'm saying one of them was a couple that moved here from, I think, Missouri, sight unseen, no appraisal contingency, no inspection requirement, nothing. Bought a house, 40 something over ask. Obviously, a title company cool enough to sponsor a show like this one knows what they're doing. So it's time for you to handle your business and bring your deal to the table at American Abstract Title Company here in Central Arkansas. I'm Jamie Taylor, host of I Hate Real Estate. If you need more information on where to close that deal, click the link below to connect with American Abstract and Title Company. Now, back to the show. That really... In Mom L. Mom millionaires, I guess. Mm, I guess. The thing that gets me about that whole situation, though, is that I feel, you know, at that point, what is your recourse? You really don't have any if you waive your appraisal contingency. But if you sign something saying that you got an inspection, you get an inspection, you close on the property, and then you try to take recourse against something that it doesn't matter because you waived your contingency, right? Yeah, the, I mean, the only thing you have is if you required like a seller's property disclosure or something, but they waived disclosure as well in that transaction. They did nothing. It was just a cash deal, pay cash, get a deed, done. Yeah. They didn't well, even have to have a title company involved other than to issue a policy if they wanted to. That's can you it. even buy I didn't think you could buy property in Arkansas without getting a title policy. You can. Issued. You can if you are right not right. financing. So cat you don't have to get a title policy even if mm. like for you don't have to at all. Because you're paying cash so you're taking the no, risk. No, people do it all the time. That seems ridiculous. You can buy a piece of vacant land directly from somebody without a title policy. Yeah, but that seems kind of silly because you don't know the total abstract of the property and you don't you know. Don't. Where it's changed hands. And if you do that and you take it by way of a quit claim deed, then you're taking only the interest the, of the prop, in the property that the person giving you the quit claim deed owns. So if they own one tenth of the property and you pay five hundred thousand dollars for something that's worth five hundred thousand dollars, then you've paid five hundred thousand dollars for one tenth of your property. That's almost like the encroachment issue the other day too. So it's like yeah. a piece of it is owned. Oh, I had by that one else. happen too. The one really? tenth. Yeah. Oh. The one tenth. I have a hearing coming up down in down in Jefferson County where somebody years ago, somebody's dad bought a piece of property for X thousands of dollars from the guy who said he owned it all and to come to find out he didn't. He only owned a ninth of it. Wow. So we're doing a quiet title to quiet title against the rest of the family. Because shh, that was not a smart decision. <laughs> you yeah. should have put title insurance. Andrew Atkins would be upset right now mm -hmm. if he knew that that was happening. So, so it happens all the time. Well, but this, I think it's the market conditions that lend to these kind of decisions. And I think that's where it's really important to consider that when we go back to the appraisal thing and we talk about no contingencies, you have to remember that people don't understand that this is not normal in Arkansas. They look right now and they say, oh, these properties are so affordable. I can pour my money into this market and actually own real property. But they don't understand it's not going to appreciate overnight like it does in California, Nevada, you know, coastal states. At least it hasn't historically. That's my concern mm -hmm. is who's going to resell these properties in two, three years when they're overbought. And then, you know, we got the same situation we had in 2009 yeah. to a smaller degree. Well, we're all hoping that doesn't happen. I know we're hoping it doesn't happen, but like I hate real estate is the, I, I mean, I, that's where we talk I, about I think it, that you the, know? I, I personally am not sure that it will happen, that you'll have another bubble pop like that. I mean, you might have some depreciation, but I don't think you'll have it to that level because so much changed after 2009 from a regulatory standpoint on banking and finance and what they have to do and well, you can't do how they approve lending. people. They were just handing out loans to anybody that could sign their signature on a piece of paper. I wish they'd and do that it's not happening. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it's not happening now, though, and so I'm not so sure. Not that to we have such that. a degree. And then, you know, with COVID as well, it injected a lot of wealth into society in general. You had all of the what were the stimulus payments. You had various PPP loans that businesses were able to get to stay afloat. And on top of that, it's the same reason why the collectible market went crazy. It's because people weren't spending money going on vacations. They weren't spending money going out to eat. They weren't doing those things where you have to go outside of your house. And so people started buying collectibles. People started buying houses mm -hmm. and property. Real estate. And doing work on their own property. People started doing, spent money doing renovations. I mean, you couldn't find a contractor. We were trying to pour just a simple little patio in our backyard, and it took us like two months to find somebody that could bring some concrete in. Trust me, I'm 18 <clears> months <throat> behind on red metal, so yeah. <laughs> I feel so you. So it's, it's one of those things that I don't think it'll pop this time. Well, and this is the thing. I And I do think, so I'm a pessimist when it comes to the real estate market just because of what I've seen, and I'm always, you know that. I lose more clients to telling the truth than I gain by telling the truth but the that's point a good is, thing it is a good thing and i but that's the reason why i tend to be very conservative and why i worry is that even if it's not a bubble bursting 
The the issue is for me, I look at the stability of Arkansas's real estate market and I note that over time, like we talked about, it's a slow climb to the top and it's kind of like the rabbit and the turtle. You know, the turtle is like, I love this state because it stays rich in natural resources. The, you know, access is great. Everything's affordable. And then you start throwing in all this outside money and people don't understand the way that our community works. They don't know where our problems are. They're not, they don't have any idea because they don't live here. But because of the way real estate works, they can buy property and market the that makes sense to them right now. And then in five to 10 years, when they plan to make their exit, they're thinking, well, I'm going to appreciate it X amount per year. And who, depending on who they're dealing with, well, look how fast it's going. It's been 8% over two years. That's not going to keep going. You're not going to have 32% appreciation in, in eight years or 10 years or whatever. So it worries no. me because if you come to invest in our community, you need to invest in it for the long term, not the flip. And that's why I'm concerned that not a bubble burst, but let you're going to turn around and have that issue if you're having people come in here uninformed about what will happen with their money. Yeah, we had almost 20%. In Your real estate agent was excellent, though. We had almost 20% <laughs> appreciation in 16 months. Yeah. See, buy houses for me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> because our house for appraised real. at the purchase price the first time. And it appraised 20% higher. That's. Can I just also speak to that really quickly? Sure. Everyone always says, the, the, the appraiser just randomly came in at the purchase price. Hi. I just want to mention, disclaimer, when you hand a real estate agent or a real estate appraiser a contract that is executed at a price at a specific time for a specific piece of property. And the appraiser's hired by the bank. And, the hire, and they're hired by the bank. And the question is, what is the market value of this property? Hmm. Well, according to this buyer and seller and their executed contract and the market conditions herewith, it's this amount. So typically, yes, yeah. it's going to come in at the purchase and price. People always assume that the bank has instructed them or that some party has instructed them what the purchase price is. But you and I have talked about this before, especially in a courtroom setting. The very definition of fair market value is what someone would agree to buy the property for and what someone would agree to accept an offer for as a seller. And they have to be willing and motivated. And what is the objective of an appraiser to determine the fair market value of the property? Mm -hmm. and so if you put those two together and you hand them a contract, you're exactly right. It's, it doesn't even have to be subjective at that point. Well, and here's the funny part about it too. So they get a bad name again, where it's like poor appraisers get beat up all the time. But that number, of course, it's going to be there. Now, if... And I've done it before, and I know other appraisers who have. If there's not the value there, then that's when you get mad, and you know you they come in low, and you get mad at them, or they come in high, and you like them, or whatever. But I really want to bust this myth up too: is that if y'all don't think that banks and appraisers have been broken up, they are broken up. Okay, there's a whole business in the middle now called appraisal management companies, and these AMCs make all the dollars by connecting banks and appraisers. And how they do it is they're the ones who take the order from the bank and distribute it to the appraiser to keep those parties apart. And you used to, the bank would call the appraiser and be like, hey, Joe, I've got this house for sale. Can you go appraise it? And they're like, well, for how much? You know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where the predatory yeah. lending came in. And now you're in a situation where there when are people between them. When you say for how much, them. you don't mean how much am I going to charge for the appraisal. No, I you're don't. You're talking about <laughs> how much is it going to appraise for. So let me give you straight up fact, too. Like this happened when I lived in Las Vegas. The appraisal company or person that I was working with was training me, okay, and to learn how to do real estate appraisal. And at some point, we had uh, Countrywide Home Loans as a client. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. And at first, we would get appraisal letters, and I was just now getting trained. So I'm like, oh, cool, a letter of engagement. And it would say, here's the property, here's the contract, here's the transaction. And we'd go out and we'd do an appraisal. And suddenly- At the end, did it say, we really want to make this loan so gets make worse. Sure it works? Oh, no, it gets worse. Then all of a sudden, the letters start coming, engagement letters. And this is probably why they went down like a flaming ball of trash into the ground, because <laughs> they literally would send an engagement letter and be like, Hi, we would like an appraisal for X amount of dollars on this property. And when those letters started coming in, I remember my mentor calling the bank and being like, is this a typo? Because I'm pretty sure my job is to determine the market value. And you actually wrote it on this piece of paper. So we ended up not working with that client for much longer. And the interesting part is, you know, obviously they're the Goldman Sachs situation yeah. of, of mortgage lending. And so when they went down, it was just like for me a very big lesson in that's why they put those management companies in place to stop things, especially in market conditions like this, from getting out of control when you have banks and appraisers in each other's pockets. So I wish you were a lawyer when that happened. You'd have taken them down, huh? I came in at the very end. Yeah. You, oh, so you were like 09, 10? Yeah. 09. Man, yeah. if I could turn back time. Hey, I started a bankruptcy <laughs> practice at that point in time and killed it. So. That's 
terrible it and terrible. funny, but it's it terrible. Is. It wasn't my idea to start the bankruptcy company. I just learned how to do them, and there were so many of them out there. Well, and that brings me to another point, though. Like people who are in financial trouble or get in financial trouble in this market, worry not because bankruptcy law actually is a good thing to protect you if you get into a situation. Let's say you have a lot of credit card debt, or you were trying to run a business and you couldn't afford your home anymore, and you had to file a bankruptcy. Yep. The Chapter Seven law actually protects you as a homeowner to keep it through a reaffirmation agreement with your mortgage company. Yep. Plus, you can do a mortgage loan modification. So there's a lot. The of system is built to support people filing for bankruptcy, as we recently learned yes, in another case. Yes, which is unfortunate, but also at least it's there's unfortunate some in certain circumstances mm-hmm. for people that maybe owed money by someone that files bankruptcy. But that's what it's there for. It's also unfortunate for people when you're owed that money and that you're allowed to file, I believe, seven times in the state. I think it's seven total. Times. Seven times total that you can. Yeah, do but it. it's over a period of a number. I mean, a number of years. A chapter seven, you can't file more than once every eight years. So but you're at talking 13, about 50, you can six refile years, what, like every five. six years. Okay, but you can file a bunch and get dismissed and refile and get dismissed and refile. Yeah. So there's lots of, we can talk about bankruptcy law in another episode. But going back to market hey, conditions. People that are watching this probably need to know about bankruptcy law. Well, here's the thing about bankruptcy law, and you actually practice bankruptcy law. So it's another thing that you can do at Campbell and Groups, not just real estate, but you can also bankruptcy law. We can sure. do lots of things here, but I know I'm doing lots of things here. Yeah. But when it comes down to, really understanding what happens if you start to lose your money, (laughs) lose your money, lose control of your money. Um, Either way, bankruptcy law will protect you. And you can go into that a little bit with houses if you want, because I don't think a 13 in a repayment plan, can you include a secured debt like that? I can't remember. Yes. Does it modify your mortgage at all? Uh, Typically not, because most mortgages that exist have more than five years worth of payments left on them. So what if you're behind on your mortgage when you come in? Because as I understand it, you cannot file a seven when you're behind on your mortgage, right? Correct. The only option you have is catch it up or surrender the house. But if you surrender the house, you surrender the house and they can't come after you personally for the debt anymore. Right, but it's not... So you basically walk away. But a 13, if you're in arrears on a 13, you have to propose a 60-month payment plan and you take whatever you're behind. So if you're behind $6,000, for example, then over the 60-month period of the plan, you have to pay an additional, what is it? I don't know. I think they change the interest rate though too, don't they? That no, wouldn't be. It'd be a hundred dollars. You'd have to pay an extra hundred dollars a month on top of your mortgage payment to catch it up. So then if you get dismissed in the middle, all the arrears catch up. Yeah, if you get dismissed in the middle, they're allowed to reallocate and recalculate all interest, penalties, everything, and it just goes through the roof. Yeah, so if you're struggling with your mortgage... Same thing happens with the IRS tax debt. I don't you can pay it off through a 13, that. but if you get dismissed, it just... There's only one thing when you said IRS tax debt, like, first of all, I got sick to my stomach. And secondly, that I know for a fact is a non-dischargeable thing, just like student loans. You cannot get out of student loans or taxes except for by death. Um, Isn't that correct? You know, there's a... Yes, that's correct. Yeah. There's you a heard good, it here first. Well, you, taxes are... There's a weird exception for taxes if they're more than like three years old, two years old, where they oh, can... Someone kill me now. Where they can be <laughs> dischargeable. But there's all kinds of other contingencies that go along with it. A good PSA, though, this has nothing to do with real estate. It's at okay. All. We hate real estate. We don't it have to talk about it the whole time. Real, but people, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, more people get in trouble and financially and have to file a bankruptcy because of real estate transactions. It's real estate transactions, medical bills, and student loans. Student, well, student loans, you don't really file a bankruptcy because there's not anything yeah, you can do. Yeah, they're not dischargeable. And credit cards. That's what you see. The three big ones are credit cards, medical bills, and Real and property issues. Yeah. And usually that arises from somebody getting in a car wreck or getting hurt and you have medical bills and it also causes you to walk away from your job for a little while and you're not getting paid and then your mortgage is due and that's the kind of problem people run into. That's Those are the people that we represented. We never had anybody that just abused the system. But the PSA is with respect to retirement accounts. Most people don't know this, that if you get in a financial bind and you have a 401k or another uh, gun, another IRS code authorized retirement plan, it is 100% exempt from being touched by creditors. And so I've had so many people come in, you know, you do what? bankruptcy. Yes, you do bankruptcy exemption. So if you have a million dollars in a 401k and you can't make your house payment, you can file a bankruptcy case and that million dollars will not be touched. It's fully exempt. That makes no sense. And it I actually though, thought I knew the bankruptcy code pretty well, but apparently not. It is though. And and it's a qual- it's a qualified retirement plan under the IRS code. So what you're saying is put all of your money in your retirement account. No, what I'm saying <laughs> not to do is to drain your retirement account trying to stay caught up on credit card payments and house payments and those other things. Because you can file Because if you do that... Not only do you lose the retirement and you lose whatever it is that you end up bankrupting, but pulling out your retirement early, you're also going to get hit with at least a 10% tax penalty on all that money you pull out. And that 
creates a non-dischargeable debt. So where you had a debt originally in a credit card that you've been using retirement funds to pay for, you if you hadn't pulled that out, you could have discharged those in a bankruptcy and, protected and not asset. had the tax liability pop up, which is not dischargeable. You cannot cure that. It's a horrible situation, and I've seen it many, many times. We that talk about it. We mind. talk about it on our website. Don't do it. Don't use your retirement money to to try to satisfy normal, ordinary debt. Some people use a retirement deal to help pay it, make a down payment on a house or something, and that's fine. But doing it from a standpoint of trying to cure credit card debt or medical bills is a terrible idea. That actually, Terrible. I mean, honestly, that is the best PSA I think you've had so far because you do a lot of great PSAs, but that one in particular, I mean, first of all, I had no idea. We actually no did idea. this one on the news. We had a news agency come talk to us about that, I think, back in 2013 or something like that. Yeah, well, we're going to bring that back up and we're going to talk yeah. about it on our show because we obviously have more viewers in the news anyways. Um, <laughs> but it's probably more correct information. But the point is, when you when you look at that, that is such good advice because that's the first thing I would think of if I had a million dollars in a retirement account. Is, is hey, oh, I can just spend this. I just use I'm this. Good. But I had no idea that it was protected because why should it be? I mean, just out of just out of curiosity, why? I mean, that tells me that anybody who just puts their funds in their retirement account and wants to shield themselves from dischargeable debts could easily just continue filing bankruptcies as often as it takes to run up their credit cards and do it again and always have that retirement money to back them up and go to Puerto Rico or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I've never assessed the reason behind why it's that way. That's just the way it is. I would just assume that your analytical lawyer brain would do it for you, but. And I can't tell you how many <laughs> bankruptcies that we filed that have multiple thousands of dollars in retirement accounts open and you just exempt them and nobody says anything. That blows my mind. And you know what? Next time, if you guys have a case, because I think you have a case where I get to go and talk about property value. I feel like we talked about a bankruptcy that I was going to work on. And if, and if I get to go to that meeting of creditors, I would sure like to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I sure would. Uh, so moving back into market conditions really quick. So we've talked about a number of things here, but going back to the original premise of market conditions, one of the things that I'm finding is unsundry behavior by real estate agents, okay? And not just real estate agents, wholesalers, other people involved in the market. Um, well, that's what this show is all about. I mean, that's what it's all about. And I think, th and I'm going to get myself in a little bit of trouble here because I've done dual agency a million times, okay? I do it well. And typically, as you see, I put another agent in place, like, Chris's story is like, in which, by the way, we're working with him again with his parents. And in that whole situation, I actually have a client who hates me, okay? And this is why I'm bringing it up. They hate me. They will only work with a member of my team and not me. And they're like, if her signature's on it, we want her to die. We're not doing it. <laughs> and I'm so mad about it because I just want them to know what happened. So when you're working in dual agency, okay? And this is in regulation, squiggly line, whatever, 8.3, I think, in the Real Estate Commission guidelines. And it talks about when you're a dual agent, what your obligations are, what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. So I'm going to let you say it legally because you know. So what is legal and not legal with respect to dual agency and or what should an agent know? It'd be easier to say not necessarily what's legal and not, but what your requirements are Boom. that you have to do and those things that you are not supposed to do. All right. Give me what I have and to so do. So basically you have to disclose everything about a transaction that you know, property condition, value, everything that you've got except you don't have to disclose any knowledge about something along the lines of what a buyer is willing to pay for the property or what a seller is willing to sell the property for to drive parties one way or another. The financial condition of a buyer or seller, which would motivate someone to say, no, I'm not coming down on my price because they know this person's a multi-millionaire or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to talk about those sorts of things. And that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Anything that would drive, that would allow someone to have an advantage in negotiating the contract is not something that is subject to disclosure. So, and there's other confidential matters that you're not supposed to disclose either. Like if you have a loan application that has personally sensitive information on it that you get a hold of for some reason. I don't know why an agent would ever have the loan application. But if you got some document like that, that somebody sent you and said, look at this, is this okay? And you're like, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you're not allowed to disclose it. You're not party. allowed to disclose that to the other party of what loan amount that they're seeking, which would also include their finances or a social, you know, something as simple as a social security number. Or, personal information. That's or a prior address of the person where you could look it up and find out, hey, they're selling a million dollar house over here. You know, there's things like that 
that could lead to an improper disclosure by a dual agent. But aside from those things, you have to disclose everything else you know. So here's the interesting part. So with dual agency, what I recommend other agents do and what I do is I put an agent between us because what I have learned is that it's very hard to have the best interest of the buyer and the seller because you're trying to get the buyer to pay at least as possible. You're trying to get the seller to make as much money as possible and you're in the middle of it, right? So how can you legally Well, And you want to make as much money it? as possible well, yeah, from a commission which, standpoint. And that's part of why, why the I'm dual agent. Agency. agency rule exists is because you get the full commission, but you're also prevented from giving away information that would drive the price up on purpose because that then increases your commission. But again, it comes down to like from an ethical standpoint, get real. I mean, from a dual agency standpoint, get real. How do I have the best interest of the seller in mind when I'm representing the buyer? I don't like there's it's not mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you straight up, it's not possible and I know from in practice that like it's not and so that's why I put an agent always in between us so this is how it results in like the everyone hates Jamie situation in that one particular transaction is because I did not like as a seller's agent I'm representing the seller and I have to do what the seller wants me to do and I'm only able to disclose what the seller provides me with right so my buyer agent who I love, by the way, comes in with his buyer because I say, hey, this guy wants to buy this house. I have it listed. I need you to represent the buyer. So he brings the buyer in and the buyer knows that I'm the listing agent. We've had some communication because I connected him with the buyer's agent. And I said, I'm going to be straight with you. I can't have your best interest in hand. You're coming from out of state. You're buying an investment property. I'm representing the seller. Okay, so here's this person. So they're working through it, working through it, working through it. Well, my seller kept horrible records. He was an owner, you know, person that rented property out. I've never met a landlord who kept good records. Like if you're a landlord that keeps good records, good for you. Property managers have trouble not commingling funds. So I know for a fact that you, most owners don't keep good records. So we get to the point where we get to closing and everything's in writing. So like you've looked at the settlement statement, everything's in writing, it is closing day. And they are up in arms that I have not allowed them to know that these tenants didn't pay security deposits when they moved in. And they, I mean, just lost it about how unethical I am, how I didn't disclose that this was going on. Like, no, no, no. I disclosed everything to you and to your buyer's agent. He just kept terrible records and didn't collect security deposits. And your due diligence and your buyer's due diligence, that's on you. Am I right? Yes. So... <laughs> So they hate me and I can't fix it. And I don't because they won't talk to me. But it's been two years and I'm almost over it. <laughs> and it's a situation that has caused me to, every single time dual agency comes up, to put another agent between it. And typically I'll make a referral agreement with them and be like, look, it's going to be really easy for you because the deal's all put together. But I don't want to put myself in a situation where I get a complaint filed because I'm not acting in the best interest of my party and or being a proper fiduciary. But then also, it's not my responsibility when I represent one party to make sure the other party is protected. It just isn't. No, and the due diligence requirement, if they're buying, if they're an investor, they're probably a sophisticated investor. If they're well, buying properties from out of state, it was their yeah, first one. Yeah, it was their first one, which, that's, which they that's did. A bad idea. I say they did two in their own community. It was their first one out of state. Yeah. But still, even at that point, you should know we need copies of any leases that exist. And they had them. That's the crazy part. They had them. Did the it's leases just, reference any security deposit? No. Well, they referenced them, but the seller never collected them. So they felt like we lied about it. And it was like, we have a settlement statement that we put together beforehand and you ask about the yeah. security deposits and he didn't collect them. And so even though it said that in the lease, like we have told you everything, you know, that's where we're at. And I thought, you know, look at the settlement and statement. If they wanted, day of to, closing, go, if they wanted to go back to the it. tenant, if they wanted to go back and say, hey, you never paid the security deposit, you owe it. Well, they didn't want it. They wanted me to do that. They wanted the seller to do that. But the seller, that's not the seller's problem because at the, at the end the of the day. Not at the closing table, it's not. Not at the closing table. And that's my point is when you get down to the due diligence period, it's over in 10 business days. It is not going to go on for 35 days while we have it under contract or 40 or 96, however long it takes these days. Um, and I don't that's, know why they would want to encourage the seller either to go collect a security deposit because you're just as likely to run off a tenant if you go say, hey, I need a full extra month's worth of rent this month. Well, here's my thought. I was, I would be like, then they're buying properties that don't have a tenant in them. Well, and that's my thing is end of the lease. I would have been like, okay, you guys get out. You're obviously not the kind of tenant that paid your security deposit when it was in plain language and your, your seller previously sure. didn't enforce it. So why would I want you in there as a tenant anyways? I mean, I want a tenant who's like secure my deposit, you know? Um, so end of the day, the reason I want to disclose dual agency issues and talk about my own burn in that area is because dual agency is very common right now. You're finding a lot of off market deals because everything that's on the market is like spaghetti thrown at the wall. Let's see what happens. And so when you put a listing on the market, it's like, boom, 25 offers, everything's over asking. So a lot of things are happening off market, which on the commercial side is 
perfectly normal. On the residential side, there's a lot of legality involved with whether or not you talked about that property before you put it in the MLS. You can't have pocket listings. So all these things are going on where agents are being put in dual agency positions and then they don't even know how to ethically execute those transactions. And so in a year or two, you're going to have all these complaints filed in about how my agent didn't act in my best interest. Well, duh. They can't. But then you're going to have a real <clears throat> real estate contract that says you're not relying on any statements of the agent, that you're disclaiming the agent's responsibility in this contract. You did your own due diligence. It's not going to come back on anybody except at the real estate commission. But that's the where it matters because that's where you regulate the industry. And that's where you choose like, okay, this is how we fix it. And I think that's where it comes down to like people like Zillow getting out of the market because they, if they're not acting in the best interest of the consumer, the entire real estate industry operates under the premise that we are operating to protect and maintain the public's trust. So acting as a dual agent yeah, makes it the, very difficult. That's in the handbook. Yeah, I know. Well, and it's also the like the rule of the appraiser. You have to like scouts honor. Like that's the thing. You're supposed to promote and maintain the public's trust in every avenue. We and talk it, about the eights and tens all the time in the Arkansas Real Estate Commission. But it's not even in. But that part about the public trust and stuff is not even in there. It's like the very first page of the whole thing. It's like the preamble Talks to the Constitution. The and the pre- it's exactly. It may be called the preamble. I think it is. I know I cited <laughs> it one time in a in a uh, real estate ethics hearing. I read through the whole thing for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> when you said real estate <laughs> ethics, I almost died because my son the other day, I'm just a segue. My son's 14 and he's finally at the age we can watch Adam Sandler movies together. So we watched <laughs> Billy Madison and he's up on stage talking and he's like, <clears throat> the ethics of business. And then he just takes his gun out and freaks out. And it's like, that's probably how a real estate agent's going to act in the commission when this complaint gets filed. Because you think you're asking in the best interest of yourself at the time. And I'm not even talking about at the real estate commission. I'm talking about with the Realtors Association. Oh, with the ARA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. That would not I be always good. think it's fun to cite the real estate commission regulations to the realtors that are acting as the jury on the Realtors Association Ethics Committee. They're like, what? Like, I didn't know that was part whoa. of the code. What did well, you say? <laughs> I mean, th- and then think about this. It's also the failure to like disclose your relationship with your agency too. Like a lot of agents don't disclose to how that works. They don't disclose that, hey, I make a commission, but my broker gets it first. And then all these things come out of it. Most people assume that agents make direct commission off of deals and they don't. In fact, in the state of Arkansas, it is not legal to accept a commission from a real estate transaction without a real estate license unless you're an attorney. I was going to say, or a law license. I know. This is where it gets me every time, too, because I don't have one of those. Lawyers can basically do anything. Lawyers can do anything. That is true. <laughs> it really kind of... Th- so that's the other thing, too. At my new job, there's like an attorney. I'm going to tell you about it after Uh-oh. afterwards. But he's... Uh, we have the same name. Well, I've already given it away. But point is, this guy is cool. He's like really cool. But when we met, I was like, well, I think you're a great attorney, but like the best attorney in town is this guy. And he's like, actually, that's true. <laughs> I was like, I know. So it was kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so one of the things I want to bring bring back to the market conditions is that if you're acting as a dual agent, it's so important that you put it in writing that you're acting as a dual agent and how I've done that in the past when I don't put an agent in the middle or I can't or in situations where I end up being the dual agent because I happen to know about a commercial piece of property and I happen upon a buyer on the commercial side it's like the wild west you can just put deals together and so when I put those deals together I am executing on the side of the seller I'm executing on the side of the buyer what I typically do and this is my PSA is I execute on both sides with a statement and I send an email in writing hey I'm representing both the buyer and the seller do you have any issue with this and this is the fee I'm charging to represent both of you. Here's the things I won't disclose to you. And then I leave it at that. And that allows my buyer and seller to say, okay, her relationship with her agency is this, her relationship with the seller is this, buyer is this, am I willing to pay her to perform this service? That way, even if things go sideways or someone gets mad at you and they file a complaint, which you can do at any time for any reason against anyone, you have the backdrop of saying, hey, I did act as a dual agent, but look, I covered CYA statement. I covered myself and I am acting in the best interest of the client and or and protecting myself anyways, even if I'm not. It's good, right? It's good. It's good. That's what a lawyer would tell you to do. Do you see? Now I'm learning. <laughs> That's the thing. I would have gone to law school, but all that discipline, yeah. not my thing. So <clears throat> one thing I really want to talk about as well, knowledge of property. We touched on this a little bit with the appraisal thing earlier, but this is related to real estate agency. Knowledge of property in 10.6 says, and I quote, a licensee shall exert reasonable efforts 
to ascertain those facts which are material to the value or desirability of every property for which the licensee accepts the agency so that in offering the property, the licensee will be informed about its condition and thus able to avoid intentional or negligent misrepresentation to the public concerning such property. How in the hell does a real estate agent actually do this? So here's what I see here all the time. Because I've gone down this road in lawsuits before where we've thought about naming real estate agents. And a lot of the time, the real estate agent just says, well, I asked them if there was anything wrong with their house. And that's it. What else do you... How If, if you have a client that tells you there's not anything major or material that's wrong with this house, I don't think that the real estate commission is going to expect you to go unscrew some air conditioning system or to go but, check the plumbing lines. Or But l- the, let the lawyer and me speak. Here's the thing. How are you training a licensee to ensure that they are you're able? Not. You're not. Oh, you're not. So that's why, what a home inspector is for. But why is the licensee held to understanding, ascertaining those facts? That's not my job. It's the home inspector's mm-hmm. job. It's the seller's job. It's not the. But, it's but not then the you agent's can say, job. But then you can say in recommending and suggesting to someone that they get a home inspection, which is what you say. Would we be actually all the time, there's actually that an that FYP assisting, about that. That is assisting in obtaining the facts relevant to the condition and desirability of the property. If you encourage someone to get a home inspection because you don't have the knowledge of what's wrong, I would say that that's what you're doing. But I think that that whole, that section, I've gone through it many times in considering whether or not to file (laughs) lawsuits. And I do not believe that it means what it appears to literally say on its face that you have to walk into a house and go climb on the roof as a real estate agent. But see, only a lawyer would say the plain language is not correct, what they mean is. And that's it. like, no offense, because here's the thing. It's, it's actually, in my opinion, what frustrates me about it is it comes back to the barrier of entry. It comes back to market conditions that we're sitting in. For instance, there's a property on university that was just listed. I don't even know who listed it, so don't call me out. But the point is, <laughs> this property is like listed for the price that I would pay for the land, okay? And there's a house sitting on it. House is in terrible condition. But if I'm an out-of-state investor and I look at that thing and I see the values of the property all around it and I can buy that thing as is in the condition that it's in and the agent that's selling it to me is somebody I called on the phone that doesn't have it listed, how are they supposed to ascertain things that are going to benefit this out-of-state buyer when, one, that buyer may not care, and two, the agency, the licensee is going to have absolutely no knowledge, absolutely mm. no knowledge about the condition of a property if and they have exactly 60, what I'm 60 hours How of education. is it for someone to sue a real estate agent or to bring a real estate agent in front of a real estate commission and say, we moved into this house. It had a leaky roof that we didn't know about, and the realtor never climbed on the roof to check it, and so they're now responsible for it under this 10.6. But the thing is that it's the knowledge of property that makes the assumption, and this is where I say I know what you're saying, like, okay, you can interpret this differently, is that if I'm looking at that as a licensee, I feel, and that's because of my experience, though, I feel like an agent should be able to at least go in a house because they have enough knowledge and experience in the field to say, hmm, something doesn't look right. There's discoloration on the roof. Oh, how much economic life is left in your roof? When was it replaced? They only last so many years. How long has it been on there? What kind of shingles are there? That's why it comes back to like, they should at least have a set of what you're supposed to know about a house before they hold you to the fire on what you know about a house. Right? I don't know. I mean, I I think. just know what that says. And I know that if somebody, I feel that if somebody took the complaint in front of the real estate commission that I just described about a real estate agent having to climb up a ladder and get on somebody's roof, that they're not going to buy that that was a requirement under 10.6. No, because it shall exert reasonable efforts and that's not reasonable to climb on a roof. However... If the agent never catches that there's something that could possibly be wrong, but if something they don't see if it, something is reasonable and simple, then the agent could would be required to go around the house and flip all the light switches in the house to make sure all the lights work and test all the plugs with something. That's so not it, hard to do. I mean, but if they but what if there's mold? How are they going to know about mold till they move in? We've dealt with that before, yeah. and it's going to be missed on a home inspection too. So who's really responsible and home for inspectors that? Inspectors disclaim even inspecting for we mold. don't know about mold. Right. And that's exactly the point. You're telling me the real estate commission is going to hold a real estate agent responsible for not realizing that a shower could According leak and this, there could be mold it. I know that's what it says. But it's not. But I don't believe that's what it means. Well, not and for he, a second. And But here's the thing. This is where my argument comes in is if they say it like this, they should mean it like this. But then additionally, I have the devil's advocate attitude about it because I feel like if you are in this industry and you are, you know, if you're just 60 hours fresh at a class 
and all you've got is that 60 hours and you haven't walked through an actual real estate transaction and you're coming out and you represent somebody, your knowledge of property is probably zero. Like, unless you're... Unless you take it literally and you go perform your own home inspection. Which is At which also time outside you've of subjected your yourself to more liability if something goes wrong. And you're outside of your scope. So it's like what... I guess what I'm coming down to, too, is all these market conditions are allowing people to buy in and out of state with all these waivers. You have new agents coming into the market who don't have experience with property, and then you expect them to have some sort of knowledge to protect their consumer. They don't. And that's why I don't like this whole thing. I don't like it either, but I I know that every law can be read in different ways. I I can only read it in English. We had a hearing (laughs) in a case a couple of months ago about a statute and the way the statute is written. And when I read the statute, it's crystal clear. When they read a statute... It's not crystal clear. And we fight about it, and we file a motion with the court, and the court says, Mr. Grooms, your interpretation is correct. It's crystal clear. They do say that to you. Well, <laughs> that wasn't the point, but it's it's that there are multiple different interpretations, and my interpretation of that is not to, Jerry Kelly, lawyer in Lono, likes to say this, it's not to the illogical conclusion of what you would make if you were to say that a real estate agent has to perform a home inspection on every property that they list. Yeah, I mean, it would be ridiculous to assume that. But does, I this, also, does it talk about agents on both sides having to do that or just the listing agent? And that's the interesting part. It talks about offering for sale. So it's see, really only talking about the listing agent. Yeah. But the buyer's agent is almost more responsible, in my opinion, yeah, to do that. For making sure the, that you get an inspection. And it's your money and that the they're seller, supposed to be watching. And the seller's agent is never going to encourage the listing agent. The buyer, yeah, the, the listing oh, agent, seller's agent is never going to encourage the buyer or the buyer's agent to get a home inspection. Especially not by the as badass as we use because every single time that the home inspector I use for my buyers comes across my desk when I have a listing they're like this guy's inspecting it I'm like great great this deal's gonna fall apart <laughs> because he does such a good job what can I expect mm-hmm. so anyway another PSA the next PSA in these market conditions is please make sure that you have a knowledge level of property that you don't drive anyone into a property that is absolutely different than what they expect it to be. Also make sure you protect yourself with the FYP document for your protection, get a home inspection, which discloses to the buyer what they should do. Um, And then also as a seller, like disclose, 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 and then disclose some more, even if there's a slight thing wrong. That's right. Yeah. Moving on. The broker's price opinion. I love this. The broker's a price opinion is an estimate prepared by a licensee that details a probable selling price of real estate and provides a varying level of detail about the condition, market, neighborhood, information about sales of comparable real estate. A market analysis is similar to a broker price opinion, but usually is limited to the comparison of other real property currently or recently in the marketplace, whereas the preparer of a broker price opinion may utilize other bases for the report. So in the preparation or issuance of a broker price opinion or market analysis, usage of the terms market value, appraised value, or appraisal shall be presumed to be in violation of Arkansas Code Annotated Squiggly Line 17421.10d and subject to appropriate sanctions. I had a broker do a broker price opinion for me not long ago over in East Arkansas, and I asked him about it, said we'd pay him for it, and he said, okay, I'll go drive by it. And I thought that he meant like, you know, I'll drive by it on my way home and I'll put something together for you. I get an email 20 minutes later telling me what the property would sell for. And I was like, wow, that was quick. I mean, he like went out and got in his car and took (laughs) off. So this is the whole thing about BPO, yo. Don't do it unless you are. Oh, I like them. I don't like them because of this. Well, I two things. I don't like broker's price opinion because I feel like that makes it sound like a broker's doing it, number one. And a broker is not always doing it. A real estate agent with 60 hours, again, can do a broker's price opinion form out of the MLS, which is wild. But the other part of it is this is essentially the attempt at an appraisal, okay? But they also say don't use the word value, market value, appraised value, or appraisal. And so that's if, not what he told me. He told me I would sell it for X. Right. So he's smart and he did play around the law and the verbiage, but... I have heard every single time somebody talking about a BPO, oh, you must be good at BPOs because you understand market value. I need a BPO to figure out the market value. That is not what a BPO is for. And I'm here to tell you, folks, it's a violation of Arkansas State Code for you to actually use the word market value related to a BPO. Have you had that happen before as far as complaints go? No. Mm. 
I bet you there's some out there. I don't think the real estate commission would be interested in that. Well, it actually says right here that any, well, they might not be interested in it unless it becomes a situation where somebody's giving an appraisal without an appraisal license. Yeah. And maybe the commission wouldn't be, but I bet the ALCB would be upset about yes. it. And that's the thing. So it's only supposed to have to determine the broker's price opinion to include applicable market data. And with regard to commercial properties, the computation of capitalization, including the rate. So I think it's one of those things too, where if you don't have a ton of real estate experience, you should stay away from BPOs, but it's your only way to create create a product to provide to your consumer to say, this is what I'd sell your property for. And this is the reason why. So you have to be very careful with these BPOs. And in my opinion, you should just go get an appraisal and pay money. Like we talked about with the survey to a professional who's going to take that liability on because the licensing associated with an appraiser is totally different than that of, of a surveyor, that of a home inspector, that of an agent. And so if everyone stays in their lane and does their job, you're great. But this BPO, in my opinion, is setting up a situation where you're trying to get people not to do appraisals, but you're essentially you're asking trying to them get a to cheaper do an appraisal. appraisal. Yes. That's exactly what it is. That's the way I've always viewed it, personally. Well, I love it, but I just think it's also one of those things in this market that can be so dangerous. So getting an appraisal, a lot of people view that as being cumbersome. Because you have to meet somebody at the house, you have to let them in, access. It takes two, three days sometimes to get your appraisal report <laughs> That's back. That's fast. In exactly. this market, it's like 10 or 12. Exactly. And a, a broker price opinion, you can have a guy go jump in a car and drive by, and 20 minutes later, you've got your number. So, And they charge like, you $150 instead of 1000 So like most things in life, okay, it's worth waiting for, and it's worth going through the yeah, cumbersome action. people are action. not patient for something like mm -hmm. that sometimes. Well, but this comes down to another PSA for the amazing market conditions episode that we've constructed together this way. Um, you should always make sure that the person who is valuing your property is a valuation professional. And if they're not, they should not be giving you a price opinion related to the price of your property because price will typically equate to market value when you start talking about selling the property. So uh, PSA. Hey, no matter what it is, as long as you don't use the magic words, you're good. I know. Don't use the magic word. But at the same time, broker price opinions, if you are a consumer, please understand that a broker price opinion is not an appraisal. It does not disclose market value and it will not help you in any sort of lending situation. So know that. Um, I'm looking through the rest of this and I don't have any more complaints today because I'm just, I've really just had enough of, of uh, the real estate market this past few days. Like I'm so tired of people coming in here and paying ridiculous prices, waiving their inspections. And then I'm also tired of I mean, just I'm tired of the whole thing. I'm tired of people throwing crazy prices out there and then people paying them and then also not taking the necessary steps to be educated and walk through the process properly and then showing up at your office with a big complaint or the real estate commission and being like, I don't know what happened. Well, take your time. This is millions of dollars we're talking about or hundreds of thousands, depending. So, sorry, I'm angsty and you're happy. <laughs> I'm not necessarily happy. I kind of think it's funny when you're angsty. <laughs> I know. I can't. I just... That's why we have I hate real estate because I can get real hot and heavy about these things because my experience lends me a lot of things to get upset about, you know, and now that I'm not and I'll just be totally honest with this. I'm not, you know, nearly as involved in the real estate market. And you know that um, outside of the show, I've got a lot of other things going on and I'm not nearly as involved as I used to be with respect to actually going out and selling properties. Now, do I have an amazing team of people that do that under my name and with me and under my supervision? Absolutely. But my actions as an actual participating broker have pulled back because I'd rather focus on the ability to provide information and opportunity to other people in the market. I've had enough of it. Sorry. I know the feeling. Yeah. Well, you actually don't because you have a successful law firm and you get to differentiate. Oh, so you're I've not been just very, dealing very with frustrated recently. Have you? Yes. Oh well, we'll talk about that on another episode because this is my shit show. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> this is where I complain and you save the day. Yeah. We'll come another show where you can complain about your law okay. life and how there's nothing illegal that lawyers can do. <laughs> Never. <laughs> well, take it from the guy who can put you in jail and then get you out. My co-host Kendall Grooms, the number one attorney in my opinion for sure. That is enough of me. I've had enough of this, and I am ready to say I hate real estate for the day. What about you? Same. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure to hit the subscribe button. Follow us on social media so you don't miss an episode of I Hate Real Estate. Take us out, Mr. Grooms. Right, will do. Push away. <laughs>